Hi everybody, it's uh, really great to be here today and, and uh, I'm sorry I missed the first um, Ian Cooper um, webinar but, um, but I have been able to watch it back and it was phenomenal, the, the learning taken from that. Uh, today we're talking about, Ian's talking about CPD, a different approach um, and I, we're really pleased to have Ian as a, as a member of the RUP and, and a very active member at that. Uh, so as I say, this second in, in uh, the series with 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 Ian. Um, got lots of other things coming up as well. Just need to remind you of that. Uh, we've got uh, some more coaching, some virtual first aid, some stuff around suicide prevention, um, and lots and lots of other things that Helen will remind me of later. I'm sure in terms of what's what's coming up. Uh, if you missed anything, including his first um, webinar, then please head on over to the IEP YouTube channel where you can watch back. Um, everything that we've done in this series and I think we're up to number 22 or 23 today so really really kind of pushing that on and thousands of people are looking at things over there make sure you subscribe make sure that you get the updates when new things are posted um, as I've always said stay well stay safe remember what you're doing as a practitioner is phenomenally important for your communities uh, and be very proud about what you do if you want any more information about the IEP head on over to the website but for now uh, I'll pass you back to Ian and I'm very much looking forward to the session Ian thank you Thanks for the introduction, Scott. Um, no, no pressure from my side then. Um, <laughs> Helen, are you happy for me to, uh, to share my screen? Absolutely, you go ahead. Okay, no problem. Right, just on the chat bar, can I just see that everybody, can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can see that. Perfect. Okay. So from Scott's and Helen's introductions, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is my own personal journey really revolving around leadership and culture and how I've used that to shape the performance of, of the staff and the students that I've been very fortunate to look up, look after over, over the period of the last 10 years. So I really want you to to consider whilst we're going through this, how you can take away the lessons from this, how you can challenge yourself to utilize a better culture um, in whatever you do, whether you're really senior top level or whether you're tutoring or whether you're assisting or whether you're managing teams, how you can take little bits from, from this presentation and think actually, you know what, that quite small idea could have a really big impact because as with most ideas, the, the, little, the littlest ideas have the biggest impact. So let's just hope this works and it does. So the first question, and I think this is something that I want you to think about whilst we go through is, is actually what makes a, a great culture? Um, and being a Spurs fan at the moment, I thought I'd get out there early. Uh, the culture at Spurs is quite questionable, but I think, I think cultures transcend industry. Uh, be it a sports team culture. I'm very fortunate to, to captain a hockey team at the moment where I'm looking at creating a culture. Um, but also at the same time, when I've been a head of division, when I've been a manager, when I've been a tutor, there's always been a set culture involved in all those institutions and organisations. So just while you're doing this, what makes a great culture? Now that, that culture can be anything from what's a good family culture to what's a good sporting culture to what's a good classroom culture. So just consider that, that little statement um, throughout the presentation and hopefully when we get to the end you should have some really really strong points and hopefully it's, it's given you really one or two ideas that you can utilize in your own professional and personal practice so what i want to do before we get started i want to give you a bit of a bit of context as to my background um, and where i'm coming from because i think it's really important for me to add the most value to you guys it's important you can see where i've come from so just to give you an idea, it is both public and private sector. So I did start off in the public sector. This was when I started lecturing. Previously, I was in the private sector. But for the sake of this presentation, I'm going to really compare the last 10 years of experience. So in the public sector, I had four and a half years lecturing course managing at, at a college. So that involved working with anything from level two students, to level three students, to, to adult students in a range of courses, um, from sport to, to gym instructing to apprenticeships. And then 
I went on to another a public sector college where I spent 18 months managing and leading remote teams, both on and off site. So from there, around about this time, four years ago, I made the, the jump back in to the private sector where I spent two years growing provisions in the Midlands, North and East Anglia. And these were all remote provisions, which I'll go on to bit by bit as I go through the slides. And my most recent role, I spent a year heading up an employability division, which was grown essentially from scratch. So, so that's my background over the last 10 years. And I hope that adds up to, if I've got my maths right, it adds up to round, <laughs> round about 10 years. I think looking at that, that is nine, but we're almost there. So let's just say the last 10 years experience in both the public and private sector and my experience of, of different cultures in a range of organisations and departments as well. So the first one I want to touch on is my four and a half years as course manager and lecturer. And before we go anywhere, the first thing I, I want to get across is, is my gratitude for every single one of these jobs. Now, experience in these jobs sometimes may not have been positive and may not have been brilliant. I've made plenty of mistakes in this. I, I want to get that out from the start, and which has allowed me to get plenty of learning. But I am very grateful for every single institution that I've worked for because they have given me a chance to hone my skills make me a better person, make me a better manager, make me a better better teacher, essentially. And, and if I can utilise those lessons that I've learned in all three of those places, you know, they've all done a great job for me. And I think a lot of things, there's two ways to look at things. You can look at things as either an opportunity or a problem. You can look at them with a negative spin or a positive spin. So for me, for the time as a course manager lecturer, I'm extremely grateful for. I had excellent experiences there, but also the flip side, I had experiences and not so good, which have been really positive in helping me shape how I manage and how I look to develop the best possible culture I can for the staff and students that I serve. So the second bit is, is what does the leadership look like whilst I was, I was at that public sector college? What, what does it look like in terms of leadership? So just to give you a really, a really brief snapshot of what that looked like, it, it was autocratic. So I say jump, you say how high. Now this was very much coming newish into teaching, having worked the previous two and a half years as an employability tutor and working predominantly with a neat group and, and a regional manager. It was very autocratic. We do things this way. There is no room for maneuverability. This is how we do things. This is what outstanding looks like. Anything else that challenges the norm is not good enough. So it was very autocratic. Now that's great for some people, um, but for the majority, it, it can cause friction. Um, what did that autocratic leadership look like? It, it was threatening in terms of threatening staff and students, bullying staff. I remember teaching um, and I remember one of the leaders on more than one occasion, I'm, I'm quite ashamed to say, coming into the classroom and telling students off and, and pulling them out. Not literally pulling them outside but bringing them outside to, to talk to them so as a new tutor that that was quite intimidating to have somebody constantly patrolling the corridors so it was threatening and bullying to students and staff alike if if staff or if students didn't comply there was threatening there was bullying um and it wouldn't be tolerated and it goes very much with the first bullet point of that autocratic leadership and and for me, that aggressiveness, aggressiveness breeds aggressiveness. It, it's like for like. And it meant, although the, the college um, in the public sector that I worked in was a beautiful place, the, the culture within that college was very much within the department aggressive. And, and that, that bled down to, to me as a tutor. It was always to challenge students. And it was sometimes to, I suppose, really to my disadvantage that I would challenge people in completely the wrong way. I'd be quite aggressive, quite threatening. Um, something that I learned as I went on in my career to, to really change and really develop. Um, but it was, if someone stepped out of line, it wouldn't be tolerated. And there was no why behind anything. It was do it, do it this way. Any challenge was met with, no, you can't do that. I, I remember a session where we were talking about marking. Um, and within that, we were talking about, do we keep it standardized? And do we always keep marking typed or do we do it 
written. Now this this may sound ridiculous now, but it was you couldn't you had to do one. Um because that that was just the way we do things. There's no why behind it, there's no benefit to the students. It was we have to keep it standardized. Um, so for me, I'm very much a believer in if there's no why, there's there's no motivation. And I just want to pause on that one um, and just see what what sort of chat we're getting from from the people that are watching helen if that's all right so absolutely does... in in response to your question around what makes a good culture or a great culture we've got trust and mutual respect um from susan saying they're important to her and her team um, and dahlia said the ability to be transparent and assertive without blame and well the welcoming of initiative so it really does seem to link in to some of the things that you say in that ability um you know to share ideas and, and get involved without worrying about the response you'll get absolutely and what, what are people's thoughts around that if someone says just do this and do it now do we think that breeds no motivation or, or how do we, or do we see that a little bit differently? I'm just waiting for some people to have time to pop stuff in the chat. But I think in my experience, I mean, the stick works when the stick's there, doesn't it? But it hardly inspires um, and it doesn't keep performance when the stick is removed, does it? It can no. be very demotivating. Absolutely. And I've not just seen that professionally, I've seen that personally in terms of hockey teams that I've been involved with as well and um, I do notice the screen flashing. Yeah, yeah Dahlia says it's demotivating it very very much is in in my experience and I think it ties in with what, what we're seeing with the trust and, and respect comments that really brings the best out in people rather than if you know you're not trusted um, it doesn't work so Ali says no why equals no buy-in or investment from the team. I like that. I like that. Yep. Um, and Suzanne says, I think this leads to resentment and demotivation, causing people to do just enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, unfortunately, it has the opposite effect, doesn't it? Trying to, to be assertive with the aim of getting things done. And if it's done in the wrong way, it has completely the opposite effect. There was, there was a study done um, about time in and time out sheets so a company wanted to increase their productivity so they made sure and they were they were really nervous that people were leaving early um, and getting in late so what they did they put in a time out sheet time in and time out with the premise being the more that people more hours that people are in the better their work will be when in fact it had quite the the opposite because people was like no chance I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there from when I need to be there but if you're going to do that to me I'm not going to be productive Definitely. Um, Louise says it does not inspire and can be quite stressful when trying to keep up with the management. I've been there myself. I, I know the feeling of that one. Um, and Dahlia says the organisation misses out on diverse ideas. Yeah. And on that, that's, Dahlia, that's a really good point. Um, a little recommendation that I'm just listening to at the moment, because I think diversity is a really good point. Um, and it's quite a pertinent topic at the moment. For me, a recommendation either um, on Audible or to buy it, with, I'm just finishing off listening to Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed. It's brilliant. In terms of a book on diversity and, and rebel thinking, it's brilliant. Excellent. We'll share that at the end of the session via the chat. I haven't got any more pictures this week though, unfortunately. That's okay. For those of you who weren't here last time, we had lots of pictures of some great books, but I'll, I'll get that shared with everyone. So uh, if you want to read that book, you can pick it up. Lovely. Oh, Helen, you dropped out. Okay. Well, those... Oh, um, yeah, Dahlia says like thanks for that. So yeah, that, that's all the comments we have at the moment. Perfect. Good. Good. Okay. So what did culture look like within this organization? I, I just want to add um, in terms of my experience, and these, these are my experiences with, with autocratic leadership. Um, autocratic leadership, in my opinion, comes down from lack of confidence in self. Um, so therefore it needs to be we do it my way or the highway and it also comes down from to a, to a degree lack of understanding because 
essentially people's insecurities are that people won't accept me people don't understand me I, I don't have a full understanding so therefore they feel as though they have to push things on people um, so what did the culture look like the culture was archaic um, and by that I mean it was as I said earlier it was you say jump we say how high which didn't ironically at a college which is all about development it didn't foster that culture of development it actually did the opposite as as people have rightly said and that culture was broken now i'm, I'm very much about okay this, this is great Ian, but where, where are the results of that so the results of this culture at what is still a beautiful beautiful college um first and foremost ofsted um it went from a grade one to a grade four, to another grade four. And I think if my stats are right, that's one of the only colleges that have done that in recent memory with, without going out of business. And that for me is not down to staff. Staff will come and go. If you have the right culture, you will create an outstanding learning environment. So the results of that culture bled down all the way into student experience, into management and leadership, because we all know with, with Austin, if your management and leadership isn't right, nothing else will be because you can't form a solid platform. So the results were grade one to grade four to grade four. Staff turnover was very high, so there was no continuity, there was no, no consistency, there was no development. Um, and long-term staff well-being, that was touched upon. And sometimes we forget that. Staff from their confidence, motivation, mental health, which I think is really, really important. Though those scars, unfortunately, run deep, and those experiences run deep, which, which essentially led to that toxic culture, which really sadly for me made outstanding people really consider if if teaching was for them and unfortunately some some very good people and some very good tutors went through some very bad experiences and then that that brings me back to my first presentation about cpd it it, it made people resent cpd because it was just another thing on a, on a never-ending list so cpd all those things they had the opposite effect so that culture the culture of control, the, the culture of power have a completely opposite effect. And the, the bad thing is that the only people that really were disadvantaged were the, the staff and the students who were the two most important people on that. That was my four and a half years there, which again, I want to go back to stop. I was really grateful for because it gave me lots of lessons in management, leadership and creating a, a really positive culture. So from there, I moved on to essentially a a manager on the BTEC side of things and the lead IV. So just to give you an idea of the context, it was remote management. So it was five football clubs located loosely in the Midlands, three rugby league clubs, where all rugby league clubs are to a point <laughs> in the north. Um, and on that, there was on-site management, distance learners. So we had tutors that managed distance learners on site. And we also had on-site academies. Um, absolutely lovely place to work, very nice people, very good culture. Um, but I think it's important that I, I am not perfect, I'm far from it. I'm, I make loads of mistakes all of the time. Um, but if we don't fail fast and forward, we, we never improve as individuals. And I think sometimes within jobs, within cultures, mistakes are seen as something bad. For me, they're only something bad if you don't learn from them. So one of the earliest mistakes I made is, is is aggression is met with aggression with staff. If you go in and say, why isn't this done? They will come back exactly the same. So that was, again, I suppose that was, that was to do with my, my four and a half years and that culture is obviously ingrained and I suppose waves of that, that culture stay with me. And that was, aggression does not work with people. Um, there is a time and a place with, in terms of utilisation of aggression, but it's knowing as a good leader, as a good manager, as a good tutor, um, as a good staff, a senior member of staff, is, is when to use that aggression and, and how it will help benefit that person. Um, but what I learned is 90% is down to poor instruction. So if a staff member hadn't done something, 90% of that, and it's really important that this, this is my responsibility, was down to poor instruction for me. Now, what I mean by that is the instruction obviously wasn't clear enough. It wasn't designed enough, designed well enough. It was too, it was too long, it was too short. Um, I thought it was very simple, but what you forget is other people have other experiences and other perceptions. Um, 
So 90% of mistakes from staff were down to poor instructions. Um, but at the same time, it's really important to realize that 10% actually is a focus on performance management. But nine times out of 10, for me and my experience over the last 10 years, 90% of errors come down to poor instruction and other things sometimes that we don't consider. And then 10% is something that actually, that with a good culture, that sometimes means performance management management is needed. Um, so I'll, I'll be very honest here that I have failed staff probations. I, I have removed staff previously because the most important thing is an excellent culture. And if someone is not a great fit, it's very important to realise that it's not helping them and it's not helping your team, your students, if someone isn't a good fit within there. And I think it was it was said earlier that trust be, breeds trust. It shouldn't be about earning trust. It should be about showing that you have absolute trust in the people you work with, whether that's your students, whether that's your staff, whether that's your commercial partners. So for me, I, I will trust you 100%. Um, but if you let that trust down, we need to look at things very differently. But I think it's very important just to come back to 90% is down to poor instruction and, and circumstances that I, I probably should have added that and, and circumstances you haven't considered. Um, and 10% really is one of those staff members that just doesn't want to do it because either they're deliberately obstinate, they've lost their motivation, or they just don't want to be here anymore. So what support mechanisms did I put in place? One of the first things that I did um, is that I'm a very big, big fan of Simon Sinek, really good book, start with why, lead with why. Because for me, I'm all about how can I add value? So telling my staff why we are doing this. So example, why are we changing student assignments? We're changing student assignments because it allows them to structure their work better, it allows them to understand it better, it allows them to develop, develop their knowledge. Um, it gives them a foundation to really move forward. It increases the path rate because students, in my experience, they, they fail assignments because the majority of the time they're, they're explained poorly. So another example of lead with why is the IV, IV process? Why are we changing the IV process? We're doing this to, to lower your marking load, make the marking more specific, help you be a better assessor. Um, and with that, come to clarity of processes. So it's really important and one of the biggest lessons I learned when, when I stepped up into a management role was that clarity of process. So what I think would be very simple to explain and what I could see would be very simple to explain and I think actually that's brilliant was completely opposite at times. So it was a real good lesson for me to learn how do I work with staff to make sure they understand things. So it, it would have been working with processes and showing it to three or four staff members. Do you understand this? Are you happy with it? Does it make perfect sense? Because it may make perfect sense for me, but that sense is born out of my perception and my experience. It really needs to be in its simplest possible form because the more you complicate, the more you add things, the more you have the danger of diluting the message you're trying to give. Um, and for me, the third point, cup of tea time, I think this is so important. And this for me is, is one of my most important points. Um, if not the most important point, I'd, let, I'd like you to get out of that. I, I love a cup of tea um, and I'm quite fond of a jammy dodger or two as well. But for me, just sitting down with a staff member for five, ten minutes and chewing the fat and having a cup of tea can be the most insightful time and the most value added time you can give. People look at it and they'll say, actually, why should I do that? Again, something I've mentioned in my CPD previously was it's just as easy to do as not to do. For me, my cup of tea time with staff have been some of the most insightful and most important times I've had with them. Now, within that, we are conditioned at times to think it has to be work, it has to be documented, it has to be this, it has to be that. We have to hit this, 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 and also do everything else on top of that. But sometimes stepping back, having a cup of tea and just listening will give you massive insights. So listen more and you'll get more back. Um, and it's also finally focusing on that communication continuum. So what I mean by that is face-to-face -face time for me is most important, um, followed by things like Skype, things like Zoom, followed by weekly emails. So it's ensuring that you're hitting each, each part, each of those three parts of your communication continuum. Um, I'm just going to stop there for a minute, Helen. Are there any, is there anything on the uh, the chat that? that no, people... nothing on the chat. I have managed to get your book recommendations on there, though. So uh, I'm sure everyone will be picking up copies. 
Splendid. Okay. So what I'm going to move on to now is, is going into the private sector very quickly. So regional, so I went into the private sector in 2016 as a regional curriculum manager. And um, within that, just to give you some context, 15 football clubs for a year, um, and that was located from Harlow in Essex all the way up to Fylde. So the Midlands are quite a loose, um, I suppose a loose, a loose term. Um, structure of provision essentially meant we partnered with football clubs uh, predominantly, um, and we would partner with the club. They would have an academy manager, but we would go in and we would deliver. So essentially a satellite site, we would deliver the education. Um, just if I can go back. Okay, so essentially when I first started, I had 15 clubs. Three of those were established. Uh, the other 12 weren't. So it meant working with lots of new staff, lots of new clubs in, in putting things in place and putting that new culture in place. Um, so just to give you some stats in terms of how that culture helped. So growth was it established the Midlands and the North and the, with lots of help. So predominantly the tutors made this, the tutors and the other managers helped develop the North from three to 36 clubs. And um, within that I also used culture, the culture that I'd looked to develop in my team to develop a great culture and help support new and existing managers. And that helped me to start to develop the neat provision from one to six clubs. So it was working with partners to, to create that culture where the partners felt comfortable and the stakeholders felt comfortable in moving their provision across to ours. So one of the, one of the main things for me is, is always to remember, personally, this is always important for me to remember, is that the staff or students are your biggest return investment. Without that, you've, you've got nothing essentially and, and you're doing yourself a disservice. So. I put quite a controversial post on LinkedIn about two years ago, which I got semi told off for. Um, as a manager, for me, um, I don't bother about the students, and that's probably why it got controversial. And what I mean by that is if I support my staff and I give them everything I can and I create a brilliant culture, they will provide students with the best possible learning experience. And then that allows me to go in to speak to those students um, and to tell them my story and where I work from. So first and foremost, I will put my staff before everything, everything else because they provide the students the best possible experience. Staff as a manager for me at the heart of everything I do, first and foremost, and the students become, the students are your, your next natural progression. Um, so you, you can probably see why it was a bit controversial, but but I do stick by it. I'm all about changing things and I'm all about flipping things up. It's not to say when when I when I visit sites, um, I don't see the students quite the opposite. I make a real big point of spending time with the students because again, going back to the previous my first role, it was the leadership team were very disconnected from the actual students. For me, that that again gave me a lesson that students are so important. Um, and it is really important to show those students, whether you're in a senior position, whether you're a manager, whether you're just covering, show the students you care and you can do that just by the little things. So it's really important to remember whatever your role without your staff, students or your colleagues, you have nothing and your business is only going to go in one direction. Um, mistakes made. Um, one of the most silly mistakes I made is to realise that, that staff have all different learning styles. Everyone's a student. Everyone is. Um, on a lifelong learning journey. And if you're not, I think for me, it is, it's a real reflection to look at. If you, if you don't consider yourself, whatever industry you're in, if you don't consider yourself a lifelong learner, you, you shouldn't be in a role essentially because you should always be improving to, to both to serve your staff and your students the best you possibly can. So one of the things was, I came to a staff member down in Ipswich, Ian, I don't really understand your your documents, they look simple, they look clear, um, but they don't work for me. So what I did for that is I ensured that I worked on all learning styles. So I, I created some interactive videos to go hand in hand. So you're supplementing both verbal and visual learning styles there. Um, context, I've, I've briefly talked about that. What is simple to one um, is not to the other. So it's refining communication, how I communicate, how I can ensure communication is, is as clear, supportive, and as, as accountable as possible. So that everybody understands it. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I've made is at times I'm, I'm a little bit emotional. At times, and sometimes it's really important to step back 
never send an email angry. Um, unfortunately, I've made that mistake a couple of times. And it's look before you leap. Sometimes you don't know people's situations. And, and if you go in all guns blazing, it has completely the opposite effect. And I have made that mistake a few times where I've gone in. Um, and it, it's that 90%. It was down to my lack of communication, my lack of skills, and not supporting my team has left me to criticise my team unnecessarily. Um, and that's one of those things. You know what? I will take full responsibility for this. I've made lots of mistakes. And with my team, I think it was mentioned about transparency and honesty. Um, any errors that come on, they are my responsibility. They are my fault because I have not explained that and I have not supported those staff members clearly enough. But flipping back, again, it's important to realise to know where that 10% is trying to to identify that 10% and performance manage effectively. But for me, it's really important, take full responsibility for staff errors um, or student errors and give staff all the praise when they do well. As a manager, it's not about me, it's about them. Without them, I am nothing. Without your staff, you are nothing. Without your students, you are nothing. So that is the, the praise. And it doesn't have to be reams and reams and reams. Um, it's just that simple little praise. So I remember when I was in, I mentioned that I played hockey. For me, little things make all the difference. I was in year 10 playing hockey outside on the grass. PE teacher, I used to play football before that. PE teacher came over to me and he was like, Coops, didn't realise you had such good skills. And that was year 10. That was a long time ago. Um, and that one comment from that one person got me into hockey. And without that one comment, I'm not sure what I'd be doing in terms of sport. And I'm so grateful for that. Same with students, same with staff. The littlest things, if they are authentic, mean the most. So support mechanisms, again, I want to reinforce it was lead with why, but three things to focus on. Are they visual? Are they verbal? Are they simple? And the utilising of the utilisation of technology, especially in remote management, it's ensuring that you are supporting staff. So if they are at home on their computer, they can access a SharePoint, they can access um, documentation, they can access videos, they can access you over WhatsApp, over, over Teams, over Skype. So it's really important to, to ensure that even though you are remote in this day and age, you should have a, you should have a real togetherness within your team. Any questions, anything flashing up from, from that? I did notice. Yeah, Louise has, has put that she believes there are still, we're still very much in the blame culture. It never seems to be the manager's fault. Yeah, I, unfortunately, that for me, and I'm, again, I, I like to tell it how it is and I like to be really honest. In, in my experience, for me, if, if the manager is not taking responsibility, sometimes look, it's, it's absolutely not their fault, um, but sometimes very, very important to look introspectively, but sometimes if it's not their fault, that may come from a lack of confidence in the role um, or it may be that there's something about their, their perspective you, you don't know. Um, a, a good example of that, could, could you give me a bit of context? Was that Louise on, on that? Is that all right? Yes, if, if we give Louise a second to give you a bit of context. We've had another comment um, from Dahlia. Where should we start in creating a growth culture? Well, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. Um, in, in terms of a growth culture, both, both business-wise, and in terms of staff, the first thing, Dahlia, I, I would always ask yourself is what value can you add? And always within any communication to your, to your staff or your team, you're thinking to yourself, why will this benefit them? So why will doing this benefit them? So it's essentially a real quick, quick bit of context. Why will, let's say for marketing and assessment, why will you giving them templates to work with benefit them? So it will cut down their market time, it will make their marketing more efficient, feedback will be better for students, higher pass rates for students, higher engagement within sessions. Um, alternatively, why will meeting monthly be a benefit to, to your staff? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it does. Um, Dali has also said, what structures need to be in place to maintain a good culture? Honesty, support, 
and accountability. So in terms of structures, um, operationally for me, it's ensuring that you have all your bases covered. So let's just say for, um, let's say if you run an employability course, for example, um, if you want a, a growth culture, um, it's ensuring that you have all the processes in place. So in terms of, let's say if you're doing employability qualification, you have everything in place in terms of um, a student file, student structure, student resources. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about the difference of having a folder to help someone. Um, and everything from student folders to how you deal with partners. So in terms of making sure you have documentation, making sure you have agendas for meetings, but also in terms of culture, it's making sure you have that, that email process at the start of each week. Here are your priorities, here's where you need to move, uh, and here's what you need to focus on. These are your most important things. That will allow that confidence in you, and also it will inspire confidence in your staff as well. Because for me, when, when I used to write emails, it was always bing, 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 here's the benefit to you. Here's how it will help you because if you show to, to your staff and to your students that you're benefit, you're always looking to benefit them. They're they're going to buy in. So, how do you create that culture? You create it by having very simple documents in terms of all aspects of your your operation. You have that consistent communication, um, and you also have those weekly check-ins with the staff, and whether that's over the phone, whether that's face to face. Um, I think that's so important. I think that's a good point. Um, Louise came back um, and said that she had a manager who blamed delivery staff members first if there was a mistake. He was aggressive and didn't listen. Obviously, it's difficult for me to, to judge without having the whole story, but just purely going on what Louise is saying, I think that's lack of, that for me is poor management. Obviously, I, I can't, comment wholeheartedly but for that for me is poor management because if if it's poor delivery from from my staff if i go to to my own personal experience if my staff are delivering poorly that's because the message i have sent to them is not clear enough or i have not given them enough supporting documents or enough material um, alternatively if there is a staff member that's been given all of that support and documents and they are not improving um, that that is a performance management issue. So, if Louise, you you feel as though you are you, you are doing the best you can, um, and you are not getting support from me, I would see that as as a management issue. And if it is aggressive for me, that is that always emanates insecurity from from my perspective. Um, however, if if I also flip it to look at it from another side, I have had staff members that have underperformed. But of also, I need to look at myself first and foremost as a manager, as a leader, to see actually have I put every every single thing I can in place to support that staff member. I think it's an interesting point, isn't it? And often managers um, have been promoted into roles without appropriate sort of support and training themselves, yeah. so they often mirror what they've seen, don't they? And and if things become tricky. Um, that sounds to me a little bit like if you don't know how to fix something, if you don't know how to support someone to get it right, it's easier, isn't it, to just say, oh, well, this is your fault, you need to fix it, rather than to work with them to, to put that right. Yeah, which, to be fair, I mean, look, I, I have been, um, not to that degree, but I, I have been that person previously who would be very quick to blame but for me again it comes back to that CPD it's allowed me to evolve and allowed me to develop both personally and professionally how I look at things because it's easy to blame someone right it's easy to point the finger what's not so easy is to look introspectively and think what could you do better so in terms of Louise's point and, and Dahlia's point I think it was as well about what makes a, a good culture I think it's being really introspective and really really honest with your staff and not being afraid of telling them when you make mistakes Again, we have that, what's the best way to put it? We have that negativity around making mistakes and that it's a weakness, it's far from it. And I think this ties in with a comment that we've just had from Ali around how do we encourage managers to make 
um, a culture shift, including taking responsibility for staff errors, because there's still, as, as we've, we've been saying, this errors are seen as such a negative thing. And obviously, you know, errors aren't great, but we usually learn the most, don't we, from, yeah. from when things go wrong. So, in, in, to answer your question, Ali, I, I would look at it from, if you're looking to influence managers, um, I would look at it as in, you need to think what's in it for them. So how can you positively influence those managers to show that it will be a benefit for them? So in terms of how will it make their lives easier? How will it make them look good? And again, it comes back to what I was saying, what value can you add to those managers to say, actually, if we change A, we get X, Y, and Z results. If we change B, we get more, we get better attention, better success, and, and here's the evidence that, that goes with it. And I think it's important to look at that culture because happy staff, um, happy staff who are developing will, will really move forward and that that for me is something that you need to have that trust and you need to let you need to let your staff go to allow them to, to make their their own mistakes and move forward it, it's it's like the difference between instructing and coaching isn't it you can instruct and people will do it to, to a certain amount of capability but when you coach and allow someone um to really explore it and buying completely themselves, they're more likely to excel and, and to do things so Absolutely. much better. And, and a lot of outstanding global companies, I mean, this may have seemed counterintuitive about 10 years ago, but a lot of outstanding global companies, what they will do is they will give their staff time just to work on their own projects. I think it's Google that does it as well. Um, I know Barclays, they give their staff time off um, to go and work for charities because it makes people, it might seem counterintuitive essentially you're asking staff to do their jobs in less time but actually it makes them if they're working on their own projects it makes them cre creative it gives them ownership it gives them more independent thinking the more rebel ideas we have and again going back to Matthew's side book um the more we can develop and the more we can really have that diversity in what we do and the experiences we have it's very easy to shut off other people's experiences and essentially if we're in if we are a manager and you're working with management teams who all hold your beliefs, you're essentially, I suppose, to a point working in, in an echo chamber, whatever you say is going to be repeated back to you. It's really important to, for me, I am not perfect. I'm far from it. I've got lots of flaws and I've made lots of errors. For me, it's about showing your staff that you are vulnerable and you are human and it will have an empowering effect on you as a staff member or your students um, because they will feel trusted in you. And the more people are trusted in you and the more you can show them confidence and ownership, the more you move forward. You will get idiots as you get idiots everywhere, but they will be a very small percentage, a lot more than you think. Yeah, I, I mean, it ties in, doesn't it, with the sort of model of support and challenge and having those appropriate levels. Um, and we talk about this often when we're working with uh, service users, don't we? Making sure there's enough challenge to encourage growth, but the support's there. But that support doesn't have to be doing something for someone. It can be giving them the space and the motivation and the belief that they can do it themselves. So that's the important shift in the culture. Yeah, which is what which nicely done. We haven't planned this hell either, have we? It leads nicely into my next slide. Well, we haven't planned. I want to see the next slide now. Okay, so um, last, last month, uh, I got promoted into head of employability. So it's working with a neat group across the country. As Scott said in his, in his email intro, it's from Exeter to Newcastle. Um, so it was remote management. So the structure was I was managing 15 staff, 14 stakeholders and developing commercial relationships um, to add value to the students and the staff in the programmes. So growth and stats and um, what, what having that culture allowed, it allowed growth from one to 13 clubs and that private provider became the sole education provider. It developed us from 25 to, to 300 students over the period of three years. Retention up from. 52 to 92% at the time I left and success from 42 to 90%. And it also allowed, as part of the wider company, um, two of my staff were interviewed to get a gold standard for investors in people. So staff development, what, what did I do? Um, a big step up. And it's something that I need to realise that that's a lot of work to do. So in terms of structure, um, in terms of keeping the division going. So what did I do? I, I created a leadership team. Um, 
And in terms of that, with, with no extra cost, because I had outstanding staff there, I wanted to utilize and develop them selfishly, but also it was really good to reward their performance. I couldn't do it monetary wise, but what I could do, I could do it title wise. And it is, it's not all about money. Yes, you want to be paid what you're worth, but sometimes showing that you have that faith in someone is, is really beneficial and it's good for them. So just to consider whilst I'm talking, I'm quite conscious of the time, um, just consider what would be the benefits of you putting a leadership team into your organisation? What would be doing like class reps for if you work with students? If you work with commercial partners, how can you alter, how can you change that a little bit? So that leadership team consisted of regional leads, it consisted of a national coordinator and a lead functional skills um, tutor in there. So what that allowed them to do, it actually, it allowed those regional leads, it gave them that title, it gave them that staff development. Um, it took the pressure off me selfishly a little bit. Um, and it also allowed those new staff to have a lot more time with those regional leads. So actually increased staff efficiency, increased staff performance, as you can see above. Um, but it helped staff. It, it was, I suppose, a really good virtuous rather than vicious cycle where it helped those regional leagues really, really develop their performance. But it also helped develop those new staff who really needed that, especially remotely. It's tough remotely. It gave them that face to face. It gave them more time because there's only one of me, there's three of them. Simple maths. Um, and we refined the induction to ensure sure that actually more time was spent with the staff there was a mentoring scheme in place and actually you know what I love a chat I thought this would last half an hour we're now on 15 minutes but one thing that I really learned is that I needed to get out of my own way I needed to leave my ego at the door so what that essentially meant was actually step back in you don't and you can't do it all so sometimes you need to think about we talked about challenge and we talked about coaching how can you get out your own way and it is tough, but how can you get out of your own way to develop performance? So onto that, learning experience I got from this role, I can't do it all. My staff can do a better job than I ever can, which is what I told them quite often. They see it better than me. They're on the floor more than I am. They can do a better job. They can lead the CPD without me sitting and hovering. And I'm not very good when people are delivering CPD at sitting on my hand. I love a chat. So I took myself out of that completely. And you know what? They did a fantastic job and they were brilliant at it. Um, and contest. What, what's simple to one is not simple to the other. How can we look at continually refining our communication? So bouncing things off people. Does this work? Because what works for me doesn't work for someone else. How can we refine that to see we're hitting all those staff? And it's being responsive and not reactive. And what I mean by that is reactive is doing what I, I said previously when I made plenty of mistakes, it's being reactive to an email, taking it personally, being, if, if I'm being challenged, thinking actually, no, uh, it's a personal attack. But actually, how do you respond rather than react? And I think those are two very different words and two very different approaches. But also at the same time, it's realizing that I was very fortunate to work with really good people but unfortunately, like with any job, the more you recruit and you recruit across the country, 10% of the time you're going to have to performance manage. And it's not being scared of that performance management. And it's knowing that if you can look at yourself in the mirror and know you have put, it's something Helen touched upon, you know you've put all that support in place, you know you've spoken to your leadership team, you know you've spoken to tutors, you know you've asked for feedback continually from tutors to academy managers to community, heads of foundation at the club, you, you are continually looking for feedback. And this is really important thing in terms of culture. You are always asking people for feedback and that feedback goes from your admin assistant, assistant in the office to your student at Bath, to your student at Exeter, to your student at Northampton. You are continually, you are hungry, you are curious for feedback because these people will give you so many insights and the more people you talk from, the more you can refine and make that program better. And if you know you've done that, then performance management, although it's not nice getting rid of a staff, a staff member, is sometimes the best thing to do for that person. And if it's the best thing to, that, to do for that person, then you, you've absolutely done the right thing. So I've put performance management in there because I could be all fluffy about culture, but in order to create a culture, sometimes you need to performance manage. And then the last ones were support mechanisms. Again, lead with why. Give those staff members ownership. It increases their confidence, trust, and creativity. And look, you know what? If they don't take that ownership, um, and you know those put support in there, 
then they're not right for your organization. Again, vers visual, verbal, simple, and utilization of technology to benefit you. So last couple of slides, just some takeaways. I wanted to put some takeaways in here in terms of implementation. So regular face-to-face -face interaction, it makes things quantitative in terms of KPIs, reviews, you, um, are we looking at our aim? Are we looking at our vision? Are we in, are we going to the same place? So I could think, I see success as one thing, some, another person may be working so hard, so hard to be successful, but it might be a completely different direction. Do we have those quantitative check-ins, but also at the same time, do we have those qualitative chats? Do we have that cup of tea time? How well do you utilize Teams and Skype? And also weekly comms, start with a why. How can you add value? Those two things are so important. And then the 30 seconders, the easy wins. Um, so I went running last night as, as captain, lead like a little 5K, keep everyone fit. Three people, well actually about five people dropped out on me um, yesterday, which annoyed me a little bit. But then actually, you know what? They're, they're not doing it on purpose. So I made sure yes, last night about 11 o'clock and this morning, I just sent him a message saying, look, sorry, you can make it up, you're okay. Those little 30 seconders, like I talked about with the, the PE example of hockey for me, and they're just as easy not to do, but they always mean the most. Um, so if you sat down with someone, look, great to see you, you're doing a really good job. That's all it needs. Um, documents and processes, I'm a simple, I have a simple brain. How do you ensure that these are very simple so you do not lose your message and ensure they're reinforced continually? All right, so people have different, differing experiences and perceptions of the same document event. Always talk to your staff, always talk to your students. How, you, how can you make that simple so that everyone understands it? Electronic platforms, if your staff are remote, can you look at yourself in the mirror and know that you have that strategy, you have those operations in place to know if a staff member sat at home, much like you guys are, and again, thank you so much for joining me. If you are sat at home, can they go and access a document? Can they go and access a video, which will give them just as much support as if they were sat in an office with you? Um, regular touch points. Are you honest? Are you transparent? Are you clear about career pathways? And those career pathways do, do not need to be in your own organization. Be honest with your staff. If you've got a fantastic staff member, if you want to create a great culture, you run the risk. And that's not, this is not a bad thing of that staff member leaving. But if you truly want to create a great culture, like Richard Branson said, treat him. Um, oh God, I've completely forgotten it now. Um, treat him. I'll come back to it. I'm sure someone can remember the Richard Branson quote on culture, but I'm sure I'll come back to it and I'll probably remember later. Um, but essentially what I mean by that is you should be giving the staff the skills to allow them to go on and do better jobs at better places, but treat them well enough that they're good enough to leave, but they want to stay. Um, is everything documented? Is it clear? Is it quantitative with that combination of qualitative? And again, I'm really reinforcing that because I have to write this when I journal every day. What value can you add? Here you go. I've got that quote for you. Um, train people well enough so they can leave, but treat them well enough so they want that, so they don't want to. Telling you an absolute star. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and and that travel. So I live in Northampton. I average three thousand miles a month. I loved going down to Exeter. I didn't particularly love leaving at five in the morning, but the students were so good, and it meant so much. It meant so much to the staff member to to see that support. That staff member was visited twice in two years. Last year I visited them six times, and they had success and retention at one hundred percent and grew their provision exponentially. And then stepping back, so stepping back, not leading CPD where others can do it, allowing them to take control of the regions, which allows for me as a leader, a holistic and long-term strategic view, which benefits all. So sometimes in order to move forward, I need to take myself out of the way. So in conclusion, your culture will define your direction of travel personally, professionally, and for your business. The more you give, the more you receive. And I think it's really important to be open to receiving because you can't have oxygen without carbon dioxide and, and vice versa, okay? What value can you add as a person, as a tutor, as a senior leader, as a manager, as a partnerships manager, working with stakeholders? What value can you add continually? And how can you always start with why? Why, why are you doing this? And I think that's really important because it will allow you to refine, you refine and really develop your own performance. I've talked enough. 
from my end, thank you so much for staying with me. Thank you for listening. Helen and Scott, thank you so much for, for organising this. That's okay. Before we let you sneak off, we've had a really, we've had a question from Dahlia that I really do want to share. So, um, yeah. Um, she said, you mentioned earlier the benefits of encouragement. Do you think it's the manager's role to recognise good work or should employees take responsibility to blow their own trumpet? Should this recognition role be shared? She's thinking of putting together a modern appraisal process, so she'd value your input. Can you repeat that again, please? So who's, whose role is it to give the recognition? Is it the managers to identify it or is it an individuals to blow their own trumpet or should it be shared? And, and how do you go about okay. putting that in place? From my experience, it's, if the manager isn't recognising achievement, so if I, I'm going to have to use it for my own experience because that's all I can do. If I couldn't recognise good experience within my sites, I don't know my sites very well. And so first and foremost, I think it's important for you as a tutor to recognise your own achievement. But secondly, actually, and probably equally as important, the manager should recognise that achievement. And that shouldn't, that doesn't need to be rings and rings, but it's sometimes that, a well done is great and I think Dahlia in answer to your question monthly reviews are really good and I'm more than happy to email you and send you across the kind of reviews that I have done previously because that review allows that staff member something to refer back to and see what a good job they are doing and then that can link very easily into the yearly appraisal. Excellent thank you. Talk too much again, haven't I? You haven't, Ian. That was really great. Thank you. And, I've, I, and everyone's saying thank you and that they've loved it. So please don't, please don't feel that you've talked too much. It's been really interesting and engaging as ever. Um, unless anyone, but we have reached one o'clock. So unless anyone has got any questions that they want to furiously type into the chat now. Um, we will look at winding this session up. Um, we will, as ever, be sharing the link for the YouTube channel and we'll be popping um, popping that out onto YouTube this afternoon. The recording will be available. Everyone now, chat's going wild. We thank you and it was really interesting. So, Ian, do not worry that you talk for too long. Um, guys, we have got some other sessions on coming up, so it would be great to see you there. I'm just going to pop into the chat the link for tomorrow's session if you haven't already enrolled in it please do tomorrow's session is around single parent challenges and it's brought to us from Liz Sewell who is a fellow of the IEP um, and has also been a chief executive of Gingerbread which is the lone parent charity so it should be great um, we do have other courses coming up over the coming oh, courses not courses webinars coming up over the following weeks as Scott said earlier including um, an intro to our IEP learning platform if any of you would like to learn more about the induction that's there and um, using the platform please come along to that we also have suicide prevention coming up and um, an, a really fascinating session on steps towards career fulfillment and the things that we can do so that will lead on nicely from the work we've done with Ian and a virtual first aid so I want to see you all along for that thanks again for your time um, if you have any questions or you think of anything afterwards that you'd like to put to Ian, do get in touch with them. And we look forward very much to seeing you again at a future webinar. But thank you all for your time today. Bye bye, everyone.